Good morning. Good morning. So I'm trying something new. I don't normally have a PowerPoint, but um, so this morning um, the Lord has been speaking something to me for a while, and it's it's something that I myself have struggled with, and so I know that this message is definitely for me, but I know it's it's also for um, for someone else. Um, but anyone know, who knows me and my family knows that we love baseball. And um, last week, we took the trip of a baseball-loving fan's dream. Yeah. And we went to Williamsport, Pennsylvania, to the Little League World Series. Um, my son has been following a specific team since the tournament had started on August 16th. He'd been following the Texas Southwest team. And we got to Williamsport just in time to watch the game that decided whether Texas went to the U.S. Um, championship game. So it was an amazing experience. And what was even more exciting was we got there and we got to sit with the fans of the Texas team. If you've ever been to any kind of an um, athletic event or if you've ever been to a concert where you get all excited and, and everyone around you is, um, is cheering for the same thing and, and um, if you're competitive at, at all, um, it was exciting to be able to sit with the group of fans and be a part of their cheering. The, the parents of the kids were leading the cheers, and, and um, it was just a really good time. Um, and during that game, uh, it reminded me of this summer when I had the privilege of watching my own son play. And it wasn't the parents that led the cheers, but the teams all had their own cheers in the dugouts. And all summer long, I listened to these, these boys doing all these cheers, and, and there was one that kind of got my attention particularly. Um, and it goes like this. You're fired up, I'm fired up, yeah. I'm fired up, you're fired up, yeah. And it just got me really thinking, it hit me, that in this, in the baseball stands or in this arena with thousands of people, Nobody cares what anyone thinks of us when we stand up, shout, cheer, raise our hands, stomp our feet. Um, but when we start doing that for Jesus, we stop and think about who might be watching. And even in our own small church, we do that. But we especially do it when we're outside of the church when we're on the streets, or um, when we yell a huge thank you, Jesus, so that our neighbor is here because our prodigal son or daughter came home. We worry about what they might think before we just shout it out. We worry about um, who in our church might might see us and what they might think if in, in the middle of worship all of a sudden we yell a hallelujah. But at a baseball game, it's easy, it's acceptable, it's normal to hoop and holler, stand, shout, clap, you name it. And it doesn't matter if it's a good call or a bad call, whether we're yelling at the umpires or we're yelling and screaming a celebration. Is our God not a mighty, powerful, great, big God who is worthy to be praised? Amen. We just heard a whole bunch of testimonies about the goodness of God and about the power of our God. But how do we truly see him? If our praise and our ability or our lack of ability to get excited for him is a reflection of who we believe he is, or how we see him, how much hooping and hollering will we actually do? How much will we worry about what our neighbor thinks or what the people in our church might think? What has God done for you that is worthy to be praised? Yeah. A lot. Yeah. A 
Amen. Each and every one of us here today, he gave you another day. Amen. That's right. I can stand here and tell you today that if it were not for my God, I would not be standing here today. If it were not for my God, I would have died several times because of stupid choices, mistakes that I made. And I would have died not knowing who he was. So I'm grateful and I have a lot to be thankful for, a lot to get excited about, a whole lot of noise to make so that my neighbors do look at me and start asking questions. Amen. Amen. But let me tell you something. This did not happen overnight for me. A couple of years ago, as a lot of you know, I was quiet about my faith. I was coming to church. I was quiet about that fact. I wasn't truly living for God. I was halfway in, halfway out. I was hardly ever in my Bible. I had no idea what intercessory prayer was. I had no idea what real worship was or how to achieve it. I did not understand that given the opportunity and the permission, God can and will turn everything in our lives around for good and his glory. Amen. Amen. And this morning, I believe that if you will let it, this message can transform your life and your way of living. I know the more that I have dug into this, the more it has changed me, the more it has molded me, the more it has really made me see who he is and who I am. And yesterday, or Friday, I was reading a book, and there was a really good quote in it by Lisa Turkhurst, and it said, Access without application will not equal transformation. Right. And you can apply that to anything. If your doctor, if you go to your doctor and you've got a heart condition or diabetes and the doctor's like, you've got to change your lifestyle or you're, gonna, you're not going to survive for six months. He gives you the plan. He gives you the lifestyle changes that you need. He gives you the food that he wants you to eat. You have it all written out in front of you. But if you don't apply that to your life, you're not going to see a change. But if you apply it to your life, you will see what he's saying you're going to see. That's exactly how it is as Christians, as we, as we dig into what the Word says, as we dig into what God says. And I believe that, the, you know, the Bible tells us that when we accept Christ, we become a new creation. But I believe that that's not just a one-time deal. Right. I don't believe that we're just a new creation the day that we accept Christ. I believe that the goal is for us to become a new creation every single day. Because my goal, I want to be better than I was yesterday. I don't want to be the same that I was yesterday. Amen. I want to move forward, not backwards. Right. I don't want to stay in the same spot. Right. And that's what I believe God is speaking up to us today. So I just want to pray before I get too much more. Father, I just thank you for this day. Thank you for this message, Lord. I know that this message is... It's a, it's a big one for me, Lord, that you've been dealing with me for a long time. But I also know, Lord, that this message is for somebody else in this room. And, Lord, I just pray that hearts are open this morning to just hear what you want to speak individually to everyone here, Lord. I just pray also, Lord, that I decrease so you can increase in me, Lord. Just use me this morning as a vessel for you. Let everything spoken this morning, Father, be from you and not from me. And I just thank you for what you're going to do here, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So John 10.10 10 tells us that the enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But Jesus came to give us abundant life. I had heard the scripture many times before, but it wasn't until I, I heard it in a way that I realized that is not passive. That abundant life does not just happen for us. It does not just happen to us. We have a part to play in receiving that abundant life. 
We have to be willing to walk it out. We have to be willing to receive it. We have to be willing to believe it. We have to also be willing to be obedient to God and his will to walk the narrow road of righteousness. And he has given us the book to follow on how to do that. There is also one more thing that I believe we have to do in order to walk in that abundant life. And I believe that you will find it if you allow this book to really speak to you. Because you cannot read this and really let it resonate and not be changed and transformed. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. So in order to be able to do this in the most effective way, to, to step into that abundant life, we have to know who we are. We have to know our identity, and our identity starts with him. Right. So today, do you know who you are? Do you know who you truly are? I'm not talking about who your mom says you are, or who your dad says you are, or who your boss says you are, who your spouse says you are. I'm talking about who God says you are. And are you living in a way that shows who God says you are? Because when we truly know our identity in Christ, we are molded into the exact character of the man or woman God designed us to be, and we walk a very different road than the world. We've talked about this before, about how people can see that there is something different in us when we walk out our true identity. Because when we're molded who we're supposed to be, Jesus is seen through us. Because ultimately our identity should lead to Christ. So if our identity leads to the world, we're not living out who we were meant to be. And if our identity leads to the world, that means that there is a lie somewhere that the devil has put inside of you, making you believe something about yourself that is opposite of the truth. So what do you actually believe about yourself? I know Pastor Ray recently was talking about the power of our thoughts and, and our minds. And the Bible tells us that our mind is a powerful tool. And it also says that what we think on, we can bring to fruition. That's why the devil likes to attack our minds so much. And a few Bible translations of Proverbs 23, 7 actually says, As a man thinks, so is he. So what you think about yourself, you can make yourself become. Which means that you will live up to who you believe you are, but it also means that you will live down to who you believe you are. But the great thing is, when we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we have the mind of Christ. The Bible tells us that we are called to be imitators of God. We are made in the image of God. And we always think about that being from the outside, but it's so much deeper than that. It's also about what's on the inside, our character. Being an imitator means that we walk, talk, act. And we, we know that the Gospels portray Jesus in the, in the form um, of... In, Jesus, and Jesus is God in the form of man. So to be an imitator is to be like Jesus. But the thing that Jesus has that a lot of people, including Christians, are missing, Jesus knew who he was, and he knew what his purpose was. That's why even at the time, in the Garden of Gethsemane, when he was crying out to his heavenly father, asking for God to take that burden away, he still prayed, but let your will be done. And we see him still go on to make and able to make the ultimate sacrifice for you and me, even though he knew it was going to cost him his life. He gave his life so that we could live the redeemed life Away from sin, away from shame, away from guilt, away from condemnation, 
As Romans 8 says, there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. He gave his life so we could live the redeemed life and live in freedom eternally. I don't know about you, but that makes me excited. Amen. Yeah. When we know who we are and we know what our purpose is, we can make the difficult choices to follow God's word, his will, and his way, regardless of what it might cost us. I'm going to tell myself for a minute. At one point in my life, my mom probably remembers this, I tried to change my name. I no longer wanted to be Danielle. I didn't think that name was cool enough or hip enough. I also tried to change the quirky, annoying personality traits that, um, and become a totally different person altogether. So I changed my name for a time to Danny, D-A-N-I, the female version. I thought that was so much cuter than Danielle. And a few people caught on for a little bit. Um, but after a while, I have an older brother who's a big smart aleck, and he decided to, I guess, teach me a lesson, and he just came around me all the time and sang the song Danny Boy to me. I quickly got over being Danny, and ever since then, I have hated that song. <laughs> It was very difficult trying to hold up that facade of faking who I was for very long. God put those quirky, annoying personality traits in me for a purpose that I didn't see back then, but I see much clearer today. And I, I have a lot of nicknames that some people know me by from previous years, but the, the thing is that it doesn't matter what anyone else calls me or what I call myself. There's only one who has the authority to identify me or change my name. Amen. And there's only one who has the right and the authority to tell you who you are. Amen. You are who God says you are. That's right. Amen. Amen. Who all in here knows that one of our biggest issues in today's world is identity? Yep. Yep. We have a global identity crisis, but the United States is actually at the top of the list. Did you realize, though, this is not a new issue? In the Old Testament, we see time and time again how the Israelites got stuck. They lose a battle. They live in fear. They never get to see the promise that God has given them. Look at what happened to the Israelites. They were on the verge of milk, of the land of milk and honey. Right before Jericho, Moses sends out spies. Several of them come back and they say, we look like grasshoppers to them. Two of them come back with a whole different story. But the thing that someone um, pointed out there, how did they know they looked like grasshoppers? Somebody had to put that thought in their head. Somebody put that lie inside of them that they believed about who they were, and they never got to see the land of milk and honey. They never got to step into the promised land because they forgot who they were, and they forgot who God was. How about Saul? God called Saul to be the first king for the Israelites, for Israel. And what did he do? He ran and he tried to hide. But the thing about that is God had already put everything inside of Saul to carry out and succeed in the role that God had called him to. How about Moses? He was the deliverer for the Israelites. But what did he do when God first spoke to him? I can't go to Pharaoh. I have the speech thing. They're not going to listen to me. I, 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 I can't, I can't. How about Gideon? The very first thing that the angel of the Lord spoke to Gideon was calling out who God said he was. Amen. A mighty man of valor. Amen. But his, the 
thing was, I can't do that. You've got the wrong person. I'm from the nobody's family, and I'm the nobody of the nobodies. He was trying to tell God who he was. <laughs> the list goes on. We see it all throughout Scripture. So what has God called you to do? What dream has he put in your heart that seems so big that you have not even started to take steps to do it? God designed you, just like all those other ones, with everything that you need to fulfill exactly what he has called you to do. And he knows exactly what you are capable of. So don't doubt him. Nothing in your life that has ever happened to you, even if the effects have been so deeply rooted in you, no experience has the power to define who you are or what you are capable of. Our circumstances do not define us. You know, there's a whole few seasons of my life that span about 15, 20 years that were just marked by pain, suffering, depression, addiction, really hard times in my life. But be it's because of those hard times, I was molded and equipped for what God has called me to do today. Amen. Yep. Amen. We don't see it when we're in our trials, but God does not waste a thing. Romans 8.28 promises us that he can turn anything around for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. That means that if there is something in your life right now that is not good and you have been praying and you still do not see the end, he is not finished yet. Yep. Amen. Don't doubt who he is. Don't doubt what he is capable of. Don't doubt what he can do in you and in your life. Doubt, as we see with the Israelites, can hinder the promise, and it can also delay it. Think of Elizabeth and Zechariah. An angel closed his mouth so that he couldn't speak a word of doubt against the promised child of John the Baptist. Amen. Don't doubt what God has put in you or what he says about you. Believe who he says you are and what he says that you will do in his name. If he says you're going to preach the gospel to seven nations, get packing. Amen. He knows what he has already put inside of you to accomplish that very thing. But if you don't believe that you are capable, you will not see him use you where you were called. Yeah. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians 12. I guess it's also on the screen. consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor, and our unrepresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. 
Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administrating, and various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, do all work miracles, do all possess gifts of healing, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret, but earnestly desire the higher gifts, and I will show you a still more excellent way. So body has many members, and the Bible tells us that the church has many members, and we are like a body. We each have a part, we each have a function to play in order to, for the body to fully operate and be effective. That means each person matters. And if one person is not living who they are called to be or what they are called to do, that part of the body is missing. It's just like on a baseball team. If the catcher does not do their part, or if they are missing, the whole team suffers. And just missing that one part could cost them the entire game. In the game that I talked about earlier, uh, the Southwest game, I believe without the catcher in that particular game, if he had been missing and it had been a different person, or if he had no idea what he was supposed to do and what his role is, we would have seen an entirely different outcome. In fact, there was a specific play in that game that had he not been there or had it been a different person, there was, there was a play at home plate that he was the one equipped to make. And had somebody else done it or had he been, he been confused about who he was, they would have lost the game. And these are 10 to 12 year old boys that were playing in this World Series uh, tournament. And I bet each and every one of those boys was so nervous and t entirely terrified the entire game because of all the cameras, all the people, all the pressure, the fear of what everyone might think of them if they lose. But they played their best because they knew their parts, they knew their roles, and even though they made some mistakes, they played as a team, all parts together, working together the way that they were meant to, and they were successful. So you are not defined by your feelings. You're not defined by your mistakes. You're not defined by your behaviors, your failures, that depression, that addiction, that failed marriage. You are who God says you are. Amen. So who are you? Well, the devil knows who you are. He comes after identity because he knows that when sons and daughters of the Most High King step into their true identity, we become a threat to the kingdom of darkness. He knows that whole family lines can be changed. Generational curses can be broken when men and women know who they are. When we meet the one who created us, we can find our true identity. But that is the only way. Your feelings, your beliefs, your circumstances do not define who God is. And they do not change truth. We live in a world today, however, that says... How you feel, that is your truth. And in fact, Planned Parenthood goes into schools and teaches middle school students that they should do whatever feels good. That they will know when the time is right for them to have sex by the way that it feels. The world will also say that if I say the sky is pink, and you say the sky is blue, neither one of us is wrong and neither one of us is right. But we know the absolute truth that never changes. There is only one way, there's only one truth, and that is Jesus. Right. Amen. So I'm 
here to say that you are who God says you are, and you will do what he says that you will do if you believe. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. He never changes, and his love never changes. Right. In Numbers 23, it reminds us that his word never changes. He never changes his mind. He doesn't lie, and what he speaks, he fulfills. And I want to I want to close by sharing a quote from a great movie that some of you probably have seen, but it touches on identity in a powerful way. The movie is Overcomer, and in this movie, um, there's a young girl who has had a really hard life. She lost her mom. She's told that her dad had died. And so she's raised by her grandmother, and by today's standards, we would call her an orphan. But because of this, she has gotten into all kinds of trouble. She's been kicked out of several different schools, and she's found in this, this school, and the only reason that she was able to even get into this school is because the principal, who's played by Priscilla Shire, has ties to the family, and she lets her in this school, which happens to be a Christian school. She's an amazing runner, and she has this coach who asks her a question earlier on in the movie. He asks her, who are you? She can't answer that question because she has no idea. But later on, she's able to be ministered and really mentored by the coach and his wife and um, by the principal to the point where the principal leads her to Jesus. And she asks her to read Ephesians 1 and Ephesians 2. She asks her to write down what those two chapters in the Bible tell her about herself. We're not going to read those today. <laughs> but you can check them out later. But this pivotal moment in this girl's life, she comes back to the coach. And she says, ask me who I am. Ask me who I am. Because after reading those two chapters and really taking a look into what God says about her, this is what she comes up with. He says, who is Hannah Scott? And she says, I am created by God. He designed me so I am not a mistake. His son died for me just so I could be forgiven. He picked me to be his own so I am chosen. He redeemed me so I am wanted. He showed me grace just so I could be saved. He has a future for me because he loves me. So I don't wonder anymore, Coach Harrison. I am a child of God. So today, I want everyone to leave here today knowing you are chosen. You are called. You are a son or daughter of the Most High King. You are set apart and sanctified. You do not have the spirit of fear or timidity, but of power, love, and a sound mind. You are an overcomer. You are meant to do great things. You are more than a conqueror. You are victorious. The spirit of God, who is greater than the enemy in the world, lives inside of you. Yes. You are a new creation. You are wanted, you are redeemed, you are accepted, and you are loved. Amen. 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 So the Lord has really been speaking about surrender lately. And one of the things that I have seen about even knowing who I am is that to surrender even myself, I have to take my hands off. I have to lay it down at his feet. Sometimes we have to continue surrender things. But as we do, the more that we do it, the easier that it gets. Jesus tells us in the Gospels, Matthew 16, 24, deny yourself, pick up your cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. And whoever will lose his life for my sake will find it. When we live out who we are truly designed and created to be, 
We look different. We act different. We succeed different. We treat people different. We handle adversity differently. So you and I have a decision to make today. Are you ready to say yes to God? Are you ready to accept your true identity and walk it out? Are you ready to quit believing the lies of the devil and believe that you are who God says you are? Are you ready to be different, set apart, peculiar? Are you ready to surrender the old version of yourself and allow God to mold you into your new, transformed, real you? The you that you were originally designed to be before you were even in your mother's womb. Are you ready to break free from living the lie of living how you feel? Generational curses can be broken if you can get a handle on your identity. I am not that addiction. I am not that failed marriage. I am not the depression. I am not rejected. I'm not abandoned. I'm not unaccepted. I'm not unwanted. Or any of the other lies the enemy likes to continually put in my mind because of past experiences and circumstances. Yes. I am who God says I am. Amen. Which means that I am chosen. I am adopted. I am wanted. I am called by his name. I am treasured. I am an overcomer. I am loved. I am redeemed. And I have been given the tools which is his truth to rise above the ashes and step into the beauty of who I am truly meant to be. Amen. And this is the same, the truth for each and every one of you. Yes. So who wants to leave here different today than how you came? If you want to break free from the misshapen identity, today is the day. You should not leave this place today the same as how you came. The altar will be open, and I know the prayer team will come up. But it's time for the church to rise up. We should expect God. We should get fired up for him, what he's doing every single day. Amen. Let's let today mark the beginning of our new life, walking in alignment with truth. Step into that walk and who God says you are. Amen. Walk in authority and walk in freedom. Do not leave without knowing that you are a son or daughter of the Most High King. y'all stand and uh, great message it's great because Danielle delivered it but it's greater because it's the truth I was at a prayer meeting last night about an hour and a half away got home late they were telling me it's just this little house where people pray. They'll have 10, 20 people in there. And they had a young man wander in there who was, was packing critters, as, as uh, Fred Drew used to say. And so he, uh, they cast out some demons. But they just said, you know, he just didn't feel like he was free. And there's this big old farmer kind of guy. <laughs> 
And, and the Lord told him, just go up and hug them. And they said, it just, it just released him. And he said, you know, that guy years later is still serving the Lord. Amen. So I'm going to pray and I'm going to go ahead and pray for food downstairs. But, but you know, if, if you, if you have something going on inside, you just want to be with the Lord by yourself, or if you want folks to pray for you, they would be happy to. And if you can, I'm going to ask you to grab a person's hand next to you. And uh, I'll grab your hand. <laughs> now let's just pray for them. So, Lord, we're just asking the truth that Danielle shared today would go deep in our hearts. And, Lord, just that desire of, of not accepting where we've been as, as the best. Even our failures, Lord, that we we see, Lord, you said we have a hope in the future, Lord. Let us lean into that. Lord, we're asking you to reveal who we are and who you are. We pray, God, that you would bless every person in this room, Father. And those who couldn't come today, we're asking for healing and wholeness. We ask you, Lord, to bless the fellowship downstairs and the food and the, the hands prepared. And in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Richard's not there to